Tabular data video. Let's start the one. This lecture is going to talk about reading and writing data in R. Um, so there's a few different types of ways you can do this, and I'm going to talk about some of the primary functions um, that you use in R to read and write data. So uh, there are a few principal functions uh, that we're going to talk about for reading data into R. The um, first two are read.table and read.csv. Uh, and these are for reading tabular data, and they're probably two of the most commonly used uh, functions for reading data into R. These functions read text files uh, that, that contain data that are stored in kind of rows and columns type of format and return a, a data frame in R. The function read lines uh, is for reading lines of a text file. Uh, and so this is this, but this can read any type of file really. It just gives you text uh, in, in it as a character vector in R. The source function is important for reading R code. Uh, so if you have a, a R code, for example, functions or or anything written in, written to a file, uh, the source function will read all that code into R. Uh, the dget function uh, is also for reading R code files, but it has, but it's for reading R for R objects that have been what are called deparsed into text files. We'll talk a little bit more about this later. Uh, the load and the unserialized functions are for reading binary objects uh, into R. Um, so the analogous functions for writing data are write.table, write lines, dump, dput, save, and serialize, uh, and those kind of pair up with their uh, reading uh, analog. So the read.table function is the most commonly used function for reading data into R. Uh, it's important that you know kind of how the arguments work, what the arguments are, and understand what they mean. So the first argument is pretty obvious. It's the name of a file uh, or the name of a connection, which we'll get to in a, a little bit later. Usually you're going to give this a file name. It's going to be a string, and it's going to be a path to a certain file in your computer. Um, the header is a logical flag indicating whether the first line is a header line. So if the first line, for example, it has all the variable names in it, then that's not really a piece of data. That's just a, a line that has labels on it. So you want to tell the read.table function whether the first line contains the variable names or not, or whether the first line just right away contains data. So did you understand so far what's going on with the previous slide? Any questions? Yes. Dump and deport. Uh, so we'll go over the functions as we go and write data and read data to the files. Um, but essentially, dump and deport are functions that you write your objects in R directly or file or whatever objects you've created. And you put them directly into files, uh, kind of similar to read.line and write, uh, sorry, write.table. Uh, um, but the, just that they are used to also write functions or to write other things in R. All right. Uh, I have a question about the, the source. Like it, about what? The, the source function, like for reading in R code in file, do we normally just open it? It's like the, 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 the sort of like a script in R, we open it, and, and then what's the purpose to have this? Purpose of having a source function? Yeah. <laughs> do we normally just use mouse to click the file like uh, R uh, file? Uh, you open? could you could do that, and then the contents of that file will be visible to you. But if you wanted to have it to have the entire context read into R uh, directly as a function, like you want to store, you create an object or a function, and a code that you have written to a file. Now you want it written back to your. Uh, you want to read that back into the uh, actual. Uh, console and have it in your memory so then you can do that by doing this source oh, okay. so we'll see that uh, the, uh, another question is about a header so for example if we open the file and it has multiple uh, line some mm -hmm. information line ahead of the header but we don't exactly know before we open it. so how do we um, write um, uh, a line so if you go down a little further you have skip but we have to open the file first have when you're reading it, you, the read.table, right? So in the read.table, you can actually ask it to skip the number of lines that you know are header lines. But she's saying she doesn't know if how I many header know lines are already priori. Ideally, you could just do a less on the file in Unix before you open it, right? Oh, I see. You can just... <laughs> in any text editor, you'll and you see can, it. And if you can't open it, just it's easier to just do a less oh, on okay. the file in any Unix command, oh, and then you know how many text line that there, how many header lines are there that you need to skip. Yeah, because some files could be huge. That's yeah. true. That's oh, true. So it won't open. So you can just do a either use a VIM or a okay. text editor in Unix and see the number of lines you need to skip. Okay. What they mean. So the first argument is pretty obvious. It's the name of a file uh, or the name of a connection, which we'll get to in a, a little bit later. 
Usually you're going to give this a file name, it's going to be a string, and it's going to be a path to a certain file in your computer. Um, the header is a logical flag indicating whether the first line is a header line. So if the first line, for example, it has all the variable names in it, then that's not really a piece of data. That's just a, a line that has labels on it. So you want to tell the read.table function whether the first line contains the variable names or not, or whether the first line just right away contains data. The sep argument uh, stands for separator. Uh, it's, an, it's a string that indicates how the columns are separated. So for example, if you have a file that's separated by commas, uh, then the separator is a comma. Uh, you might sometimes files are separated by semicolons or by tabs or by spaces. And so you want to tell read.table what the separator is going to be. Call classes uh, is a character vector which in, uh, which, whose length is the same length as a number of columns in the data set. And the character vector indicates uh, what, what is the class of each column in the data set. So for example, is the, if the first column is numeric, and the second column is logical, and the third column is a factor, etc. And so the call class is a vector, which is not required, uh, but it tells, it tells read.table what the class of the data is for each column. And rows is the number of rows in the data set. This is not required, but it, uh, it can be used. Comment.char is the character string that indicates uh, what's the comment character. So the, uh, so the default, for example, is the pound symbol or the sharp symbol. Uh, and anything after the, anything to the right of that symbol uh, is ignored, the comment character. So you can specify other characters to be, co the, to be comment characters. And the lines of, lines of the file that begin with that comment character will be ignored. Uh, skip is the number of lines to skip from the beginning. So sometimes there may be some header information or some non-data region at the beginning of the file, and you want to skip right over that. Um, and so you can tell the read.table function to skip, to say, the first 10 lines or the first 100 lines, and then only start reading data after that. The last argument is strings as factors. Uh, this defaults to uh, true, and the idea is that it would, the question is whether do you want to encode character variables as factors. Uh, so by default, anytime our read.table encounters a column of data that looks like it's a character variable, it will call, it will assume that what you what you mean to read in is a, is a factor variable. If you don't mean, mean to read this in as a factor variable, then you can set strings as factors equal to false. Is that part clear? The string as factors. Uh, so factor is basically, um, so it's a class in in R in, in as a uh, of it. So something can be of type of a factor. So for example, if you have uh, a data or a column uh, of sorts which has uh, two categories. So mm -hmm. say you have a population and it's male and female, mm -hmm. then you can have the column will contain only male and female as values for whatever your, you know, let's say it's a database, so uh, it's a whole table containing information about uh, people mm -hmm. in a city. Mm -hmm. So age, uh, you know, whatever um, address, and then the sex is male or female. So then those are the factors. Those are the only, there'll be only two categories of data. And then these are very useful when you are doing categorical data analysis in statistics. So when you're trying to create a linear model, then, you know, you have to define the factors of that data if any. So if it's a string data, then you will have factors of that, or categories of that. Okay. So in R, by default, string, strings used to be, it used to be that there will be only, strings were only used in R as factors initially. Uh, so historically, they would only use factors for, uh, so every string would be a factor. So for example, um, if it was you were doing a table and you wanted to do a linear model of something, it would be let's say children. There, you know, there are two, uh, three different kinds of children or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, so anxiety based or normal or borderline ADD. Or th these were the three categories, you know. So that's why by default R converts every string column in a data frame to factors. It'll calculate the factors for that. So factors will be the unique occurring. Uh, uh, strings in that column. Okay. So for small and kind of moderately sized data sets, and as computers kind of get better and better every day, the definition of small and moderate is kind of growing. Uh, but you can use read.table usually without specifying any of the other arguments besides you know the file name. So you can say read.table on say foo.txt, uh, so this is just the name of the file, and it will automatically take care of figuring out you know what the classes of the different columns are. It will figure out how many rows there are, etc. So you don't have to specify any of that information if you don't feel like it. And, and then and this will, this will return an object here that I call data, and that will be a data frame. 
So it will automatically skip any lines that begin with the comment symbol. Uh, it will figure out how many rows there are, uh, and again, it will figure out what type of variable is in each column of the table. So telling you can now you can tell R all these things, uh, and if you want to, and the reason you might do that is to make it run faster and more efficiently. So with um, small and moderate sized data sets, there's really not much advantage to doing that uh, uh, because um, it will be pretty fast and pretty efficient uh, as it is. The read.csv function is identical to read.table, except for the key difference is that the, the default separator for the read.csv function is the comma, whereas the default separator for read.table is a space. Um, so particular, so read.csv is useful for reading CSV files. These, these can usually be, so that stands for comma separated value. Uh, it's usually something that you get from a spreadsheet program like Microsoft Excel or something similar to that. So CSV is a very common format. Uh, that most spreadsheet types of programs will understand. Um, the other thing that read.csv specifies is that it always specifies header to be equal to true. Is that clear in, in this lecture, basically in this uh, video, they were just talking about the multiple ways to um, read data. And uh, that said, uh, how do we stop? How do I stop the recording? <laughs> Has anybody done this before? Oh, there. There are other types of formats uh, that you can save data in beyond the tabular format beyond, or, or the CSV file or text file. Um, these are also textual formats, but they're a little bit different for from the tabular data that we've talked about before. Um, and the two main functions for writing out data and for are dumping and de-putting. So, and, and the idea behind these types of formats is that they're text formats, but they're not really, um, they are not really formatted in a way that's uh, in the same as like a table because they contain a little bit more metadata. So data about, for example, the type of the data in um, in each in each uh, object, for example. So if you if you dump or de put uh, a data frame, it will include in the output um, the the class of each column of the, of the data frame. So you don't have to specify it when you read it in. And so the advantage of of doing of using this type of mechanism to store data or to read or to read data is that you don't have it's still a textual format uh, which can be useful uh, but it also contains metadata so that you don't have to specify it every single time you read it in because then if you don't if the metadata do not get carried with the data set itself uh, then it, they, they can get lost if you if they get transferred somewhere else and if you don't remember what the metadata are for example the classes of the different columns then you kind of have to reconstruct that from scratch um, so that's one advantage of using a, using a function like dump or deput to um, to output data from R. And similarly, the um, uh, the 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 functions for reading data using for, that have been outputted using dump or deput are source and uh, dget. Um, so in general, uh, textual formats are very nice formats for uh, storing data because. Um, um, there's a, a number of different types of uh, different advantages to them. First of all, they're editable, so you can, if you want to, you can edit them. Uh, I wouldn't say this is something that I would advise, uh, but because of you wanted something that's reproducible. But for example, if something gets corrupted, um, then you can look at the you can look at the file to see if it's possible to recover it. So textual formats can be a little bit longer lived. Um, if you're going to be storing data for a long time, sometimes it's useful to if it's possible to use a type of textual format um, so that you can avoid problems, potential problems with corruption. Um, textual formats can also work better if you're using like a version control program like Subversion or Git uh, where you're tracking changes between documents um, and, and those types of programs tend to be much more useful with textual data rather than binary data uh, so that you can track changes meaningfully. Um, textual formats adhere to the general kind of Unix philosophy uh, which is to store all kinds of data, which generally stores all kinds of data in text. Um, uh, but the one downside with textual formats is that they tend not to be very space efficient. So they tend to, to they tend to take up a lot of space, um, and so it often need to be compressed. So uh, deep the deep put function takes an, uh, an arbitrary R object, um, and it will, you, it will take most types of R objects except for some more exotic ones, uh, and it will create some R code that will essentially reconstruct 
the object in R. So here I'm creating a small data frame. It's got two columns. Uh, the first column is called A. The second column is called B. Um, and then I'm going to deput this data frame. And you'll see the out if you just call deput, it will just output the result to the console. And you can see that what I've done is what it does is it's it's, re it's constructed some R code. Uh, for example, it's creating this list that has these two elements in it, and you can see that each element has um, uh, has the data that's in it, and uh, it has the names embedded here. It's got the row names uh, here, um, and it has the class of the object, which in this case is a data frame. And so all the metadata here, like the row names and the names and the class, are all included in the output. Now, of course, you generally don't want to uh, print this to the console. It's not particularly useful. You probably want to save it to a file. So you can deput the object to a file. Um, and then later on, you can read it into R using dget. Uh, and when you dget the object, you'll get this object, and you'll see that it's you've kind of reconstructed the object from before. So the dput function essentially writes R code, which can be used to reconstruct an R object. The dump function is a lot like dget. However, the difference is that uh, dget can only be used on a single R object, whereas dump can be used to, uh, on multiple R objects. And so what you do is that what you pass to dump is a character vector which contains the names of the objects. So here I've created two objects, one called x, the other called y. And what I pass to dump is are the names of those objects. So the names are x and y. And I give it a file um, that I want to store the objects in. Um, and then I can remove them if I want to, but to read those objects back into R, I can call the source function on that file, and you'll see that the Y object and the X object have been reconstructed. Site intro to bioinformatics, and under there we are on uh, this part feeling loopy. This is how we got here, right here, feeling loopy. We click that, and then uh, we get to uh, our uh, code files for this book. And we download that, and then once we unzip it into a folder, um, we can see over here uh, in the code files, you will have this file called readwritedata.r. So we right click on that and we go open with, and then we open that in our studio app. Okay, so hopefully. Once you open that, then we're going to start to um, go through it step by step. So here we're trying to create a data frame. And um, so, oh, all right. never mind. What is the, do you know what the clear screen function in R is? They lied. <laughs> Try Option Command L. It'll clear the console. No. All right. Never mind. Let's just you know press a bunch of enters and we'll be good. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> okay. So um, we're gonna try and run this. We create a data frame Y using specifying the um, the columns. So notice when you say a is equal to one, you're actually specifying that this uh, this variable this is a column name, then and b is equal to the character a. And so if you see y here, uh, if we click y, so y has two columns, a and b, and the value of a column is one, and the value in b is a, the string. Uh, now uh, we're gonna try to see first of all we're gonna see. Uh, what directly directory we're in. So you can do that by doing get wd. I'm just gonna move this higher so you can see. So you can do by get wd and so I'm in this directory. Uh, I'm actually gonna change this directory right now because I want to be somewhere else. So that should be the first thing you do which is kind of right here where you go change directory to working space. So wherever you're working. So the, the, does everybody know by now how to change directory? You use a set WD and then okay so the, w the way you do it is you use this command set WD alright right here. I hope you can see this set WD command 
and then you type the directory where you want to go. Right? So very similar Unix format slash whatever directory. So I had created a separate folder under my bioinformatics folder in my computer called the advanced class R and then the read write data because we're studying read write data today. So I'm going to change over there and then that's where I'm going to store all my output from my uh, so that by default now everything that I output or deput or whatever variables there are going to be files will be created in this folder uh, in my folder. All right, so let's start with dput y. So now if you just put dput y, what happens is that it just outputs this thing to the console. So right here, you can see that it tells you that uh, it creates a structure of list where a is equal to 1 and b is another structure with one element, label is there, and then the class is a factor, and then uh, the names uh, for this uh, structure are uh, a and b of this data frame. So if any of you are familiar with C, you have structures in C. And R here is the put function is basically creating that kind of structure and writing this to a file. So let's, uh, let's do that. So basically the advantage of using deep put is that it creates all this metadata about your data frame, which you can then store in a file. And then later on when you have to read it, you don't have to repopulate the metadata for that object. Do you understand the concept of metadata? It's like TST. Uh, well, metadata is basically data that describes data. <laughs> Hence the meta. So it's basically when you have information about what that data is. So for example, here, you're saying that the names of these columns are A and B. So that is actually information about the data frame itself. Do you understand? So then, in that case, the row names, for example, are, uh, are these. The class of this entire thing is a data frame. Now, when you just have a text file, which just supposing you just have a text file that contains this 1 and A, right? Then that does not contain any information about what 1 is or what A is. When you save it as a CSV file, at most, you, can, you have to specify specifically that you want the A and B as the column names to be written. If you just do read dot c uh, write dot csvy, then it's not gonna write these extra a and b and one or, or is it, right? So that's why this kind of deput stores that information for you. So here, let's try to store it in a y dot r file, and now we're actually going to go over there, in this folder, and see what has just been created. So if I'm just going to zoom zoom in on this. I don't know if you can. Can you read this? So this is the exact same information that we had, uh, which uh, was output to the console, is stored in this file called y.r. So this is y.r. Right? Can you explain this row, uh, row dot names thing? Sure. Where? In, in, inside the y.r file? Yeah, on the output on the console, you have row yes. dot names. Uh, so these are the names for the rows. It's basically There's only one row, and it's only got an index one. Yeah. So maybe it's saying that this is NA. This particular row, the column name is not a row. Zero is not NA, and then minus one L. Minus one L is just the way it's storing. Uh, I think it's just basically the way it's storing this data and it's reading it back. The good thing is that when, once you read it into a new variable, new.y, it exactly outputs your uh, this. Now, another thing we could do is potentially go in here and actually change this information. So let us say we open this here, and instead of minus 1L, we just make it 1L, right? And then we save it, right? And then let's go back, and we are going to try and read this exact file. And now what happens is that actually it doesn't make any difference. <laughs> okay, but technically the possibility is there. So let's say we change this. I'm I'm just you know playing around, right? So it didn't matter. So I don't know whether it's, I mean, one of the things that they, I was reading about Deepwood is that it's very robust, so it kind of, you can make changes, but you can still recover the original thing. So it has a lot of default settings. Yeah. You know, 
Yeah. So it's a R specific way to store data. But I but it's not reader friendly. Because if you open No, it's not reader friendly. Okay. So it's not very friendly to read, but it's more for you to store your data and have the metadata stored with it. Okay. It's just with that assumption. Is one L like a type? Because I see the structure one L as well. Uh, it is a type. So it is pro it, L is for integer. Oh, okay. So, so, okay, so now let's create another variable foo, and then we create this y as a data frame, one as an integer. Remember when we were studying integers, we said that how to explicitly declare an integer is to add an L to it. Mm -hmm. So that's what L is here. So that's what we're doing. We're saying A is an integer of, uh, and it has a value one. So if you don't do the L, then what happens is that it becomes a, well, the class of A. So if we do D put Y, I guess it's still, by default, it just makes it <laughs> that. Okay. So the other option then we do is dump x y comma r so we can do that uh, which basically means that we're just creating this data dot r file let's see how if that is any way in any way is different it's slightly different it contains x is foo because it contains not just uh, one variable it contains two variables and then we can read that as well and now if we remove x and y so one way to know that uh, whether you've removed it is to go ls and then x and y should not be here. Obviously, these are all the variables that I had from before. So if you ever wanted to remove everything in your workspace, not, not like delete it, but in your console workspace, then you just do uh, rm list is equal to ls. And then now if I do ls, so it contains, my memory is wiped clean. So it clears all variables. It cre clears all variables in your memory. And now if I, again, go source data.r, and now if I just go ls here, you have two variables that come in x and y. So that just goes to show that it uh, was able to read um, every variable that we stored in through the source command. Can you remind me what C is again? Sure, C is to create a vector. Create. Okay. So C is when you're trying to create a vector. And now moving on to A, we create another data frame. Um, and B, so let's first see what B is. Okay. Sorry. And so B is basically a vector containing three elements, one divided by three, 4.4, 4 and three. And then A, so what is happening here? Anybody? Random, random normalized, normal distribution. And how many numbers uh, are we? There you go, there you go. So what, if we do, uh, uh, let's do a head on A. So you have x and y, and if you do a dim on A, it contains 100 rows and two columns. And so if you're confused about what runf does, you can always search for it here, and it shows you uh, generates random deviates. If the length of this run is... Anyway, so the whole point is we're creating a a, a data frame with two um, two columns, with just basically real numbers of sorts. Uh, and so we save this using the save command a comma b and file is equal to my data dot rda. So uh, now let's go back and see what we have here. So we have my data dot rda. Now let's if we try to open it uh, with let's say text wrangler so this is a binary file right 
So our data is a binary file that contains the compressed state in binary format of your uh, of whatever variables you're storing. I think we're we may have we may have gone a little further ahead. So we're gonna go and watch the other two videos, and then we can uh, you know go from there. So with larger data sets, so beyond the small to moderate, um, then there are a couple things that you can do uh, when reading in tabular data that will make your life your life a lot easier, and also, and, and more importantly, will prevent R from totally choking. So uh, first, you should read the help page for read.table. Um, you should, in fact, you should probably have it memorized. There's a lot of key hints in that help page, and a lot of useful information. And in, in my opinion, not enough people read this help page carefully enough so that they can kind of recite it in their sleep. Um, and, the, and so there's a lot of, so once you've read that, you'll see there's a lot of important information for kind of how to optimize read.table, in particular for large data sets. And so one of the things you're going to want to do is, is to make a very rough calculation of how much memory um, you need to store the data set you're about to read. Um, and so in that way you can get a sense of, well, is there enough memory on my computer to store this data set, because if you recall correctly, uh, R will have to, R is going to store your entire data set in memory unless you do otherwise. So when you call read.table or read.csv, it's reading your entire data set into the RAM of the computer. Um, and so you need to know, roughly speaking, how much RAM this data set is going to require, uh, and we'll talk about how to calculate that in a second. So another opti easy optimization you can say is um, if there's no comment lines in your file, then just set the comment char to be the comment dot char argument to be blank. So just an, an empty quote there. Uh, the call classes argument is actually very important uh, because when if you don't specify it, then what R does def by default is it goes through every column of your data set and tries to figure out what type of data it is. Now, that's all fine, well and fine when the data set is small to moderate, but reading each of these columns and trying to figure out what type of data it is takes time, it takes memory, and it can generally slow things down. If you can tell R what type of data is in each column, then R doesn't have to spend the time to figure it out on its own. Uh, and so it'll, it, it'll generally make read.table run a lot faster. Uh, and so you can save yourself a lot of time. So if you, if, if you have a few columns in your data set, then, uh, then you can usually just say what the, what the classes are, but if you have, um, if for, or if they're all the same, then you can, so for example, if all the columns are numeric, you can just say you can just set call classes equal to numeric, and if you only send, you give it a, spit, a, a single value, it will just assume that every column has that same value. So that every, if you just say numeric, it will assume that every column is numeric. Uh, otherwise, what you can do if you have a huge data set, you can read in maybe the first hundred or the first thousand rows um, by specifying the n rows argument, uh, and then going through each of the um, uh, uh, looping over each of the columns uh, using s apply and calling the class function. So the class function will give you will tell you what class of data is in each column, uh, and then you can use this, and then you can say store this information, and then read uh, the entire data set after by specifying the call classes argument. So did you get this part? So it's basically saying that um, in order to save time, uh, you can specify the class of that column. So basically meaning what data type that column will, that will speed up your R reading. But how do you know, for example, what is the class if you do not, if you haven't seen that data before, right? So one way is to first just read the number of 100 rows. So it's just like doing head or doing a short read on the first 100 lines. And then you call this s apply function. So we're going to be covering apply in our next class on Monday. So, I don't understand how right, so apply functions and functions in general will be covering in uh, in the next class. But essentially, what this is saying is that uh, if you forget about the name as apply, it's saying that take the database, oh sorry, data frame, which is initial, and then apply this function class so to each column of that database. So what that means is that it returns to you what class every single column is off. Does that make sense? So, and then that gets stored into this classes variable. And then here you're saying read dot table, now read the entire table. Notice n rows equal to 100 is absent. We're reading the entire table, except now we know the classes because we just found that out by doing this. So we're gonna use those classes.
Okay? Okay. So the n rows argument um, is actually very useful too. It doesn't necessarily make R run any faster, but it does help with memory usage. And so if you can tell R how many rows um, are going to be read into the, to the into, into R, uh, then it can calculate the memory that's going to be required and not have to kind of figure it out on the go. So even if you mildly overestimate how many rows there are in the data set, that's okay um, uh, because uh, it won't make a difference. It'll still read the correct number of rows. So there was a short line in the end that says, uh, if you can, yeah. Um, The, the thing that I was saying was that you can basically uh, use the WC command in Unix to find out how many lines are there in your file. So WC minus L gives you the number of file lines in your actual file. So you can just set N rows to WC minus L uh, output from Unix. So then you know. Okay. Um, so in general, when you when you're using R with large data sets, and, and there's lots of large data sets out there nowadays, um, it's useful to have a few things, just kind of a few bits of information on hand. So for example, how much memory does your computer have? How much physical RAM is there? These days, most computers will have on the order of a few gigabytes up to many gigabytes of physical RAM. Um, what other applications are in use? So are there other applications that are running on your computer that may be eating up some processor, processor time or memory? Um, if you're on a multi-user system, uh, are there other users logged into the system? Are they using up some of the resources on the computer? Um, what is the operating system for your computer? So is it a Mac? Is it Windows? Is it Unix? Is it Linux? Is it something like that? And then also it's useful to know whether the, the operating system that you're running is 32-bit or 64-bit. On a 64-bit system, uh, uh, there, there you'll generally be able to uh, access more memory if the computer has a lot more memory. So if you want to do a rough calculation before you read in a table into R uh, using the read.table or the read.csv function, uh, you can just do a very quick calculation. So here, suppose I have a data frame here uh, with 1.5 million rows and 120 columns. So this is not a particularly big data set, but it's reasonable. Um, so and suppose that all of, the new, all of the columns are numeric. So I don't have to worry about different types of data. They're all, all the columns are numeric. Uh, the question is, how much memory is required to store this data frame in memory? Okay, so I can do a simple calculation. So the number, the number of elements in this data, in this data frame is going to be 1.5 million times 120, right? Because it's a square object, uh, and so that's so that's the number of elements uh, in the data frame. Now, if it's a numeric, uh, all the data are numeric, then each number requires eight bytes of memory uh, to store because the because the numbers are stored using 64-bit numbers, and there's eight bits per byte, so that's eight bytes of memory per numeric object. Uh, so that's going to be, so here's the number of bytes. Now, um, there's 2 to the 20 bytes per megabyte. Um, and so I can divide that the number of bytes by 2 to the 20, and that's how many megabytes I got. So it's got, I've got 1,373.29 megabytes. Uh, and I can divide that again uh, by 2 to the 10 to get the number of gigabytes. So it's going to be roughly 1.34 gigabytes. So the the raw storage for this data frame uh, is of roughly 1.34 gigabytes. Uh, now, you're actually going to need a little bit more memory than that to read the data in because there's a little bit of uh, overhead required for reading the data in. And so, um, and so the rule of thumb uh, is, to, is that you're going to need almost twice as much memory to read this data set into R using read.table uh, than, the, than the object itself requires. So if your computer only has, let's say, 2 gigabytes of RAM, and you're trying to read in this 1.34 gigabyte table, um, you might want to think twice about trying to do it because it, you're going to be pushing the boundaries of, uh, of memory that, that is required to read this data set in. Of course, if your computer has like 4 or 8 or 16 gigabytes of RAM, then you should have no problem uh, in terms of the memory requirements. It will still take some time just to read it in just because the, uh, it, it takes time to read in all the data, but you won't be running out of memory. So doing this kind of calculation is enormously useful when you're reading in large data sets because it can give you a sense of, you know, do I have enough memory? Is the reason, if you run into any errors, you'll know whether the error is because of memory, running out of memory or not. So I encourage you to do this kind of calculation. So there are a variety of ways that um, you can interface between R with the outside world. Uh, and generally speaking, uh, there are functions uh, that, that are 
use to kind of open up what are called connections to the outside world. Um, usually, you want to, the most common type of connection is to is to a file. So, for example, if you want to read a file, um, then you can you can create a file connection. You might want, to, for example, o a read a compressed file. That's a slight variation on that. Uh, and most functions will do this in the background without you having to know what's going on. So, for example, when you call read.table with a and you pass it the name of a file, what it does behind the scenes is it opens up a file connection to that file and then reads from that file connection. But connection can be made to other types of um, uh, objects too. For example, you can open a connection to a web page uh, using the URL function. And so when you open a connection to a web page, you can read data from that web page using the URL connection. And so the idea behind the connection interfaces is that it kind of that it abstracts out uh, the mechanism for connecting to different types of objects that are external to R, whether they be files or web pages or whatever. So the file f uh, function is the a function that opens a connection to a standard uh, uncompressed file. Um, so this this can be useful for text files, for, re for reading in uh, other types of text files. Uh, GZ file and BZ file are used for opening connections to compressed data files. So GZ file is used for um, files that are compressed with the gzip algorithm, and BZ file is used for, is for opening connections to files compressed with the bzip2 algorithm. Um, Files that are compressed with gzip usually have a gz uh, extension, and files compressed with bzip2 usually have a bz2 extension. Uh, so the file function here has a few arguments. The description argument is the name of the file, and then there's a flag uh, that that's, goes to the open argument, and you have to know what the codes are. Basically, R is for reading, W is for writing, A is for appending, and then RB, WB, and AB are for reading, writing, appending on binary files. Uh, the other options for file are not particularly important at this time. So connections can be very powerful, and they can let you uh, navigate files uh, and other external objects in a more sophisticated way than just like reading the whole thing, for example. Um, in general, you don't have to deal with the connection interface uh, in many cases, but sometimes it's useful. So, for example, so here I've got a simple example where I'm opening a, f a file connection to some file called foo.txt. I want to open it for reading. Uh, I can call read.csv on the connection, and that by default will just read the entire file. Uh, and then I can close the connection. So that three-line process is the same as just calling read.csv on the file. Um, so it's, it's, in this case, there was no need to use the connection um, to read the file. However, sometimes a connection can be useful if you want to read parts of a file. Uh, so for example, here I've got the read lines function, um, which just reads lines from a text file. And I'm going to open up this uh, words.gz file. So this is a file that has uh, words in it. Uh, for, it's like a dictionary file. Uh, and it's compressed using the, GZ, the gzip algorithm. So I'm going to use the gz file function to open a connection to that. And I'm just going to read the first 10 lines. So now I'm going to use this connection and to read the first 10 lines. And here, the first 10 lines are printed out here. Um, and you can see these are the first kind of 10 words in the file. And so similarly, write lines is a, is a function that can be used to write out lines of text to a file. And, each el and what you do is you pass write lines character vector, and each element of the character vector becomes a line in the text file. Uh, you can also use read lines to uh, read elements from a web page. So, for example, you can use the URL function to create a connection to uh, a website. So this website here is the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health website. Um, I'm going to open a connection there for reading. And then I'm going to read lines from this connection. Um, and so, uh, and, I'm, and then, and so the lines of text that come from the connection are going to be stored in this character vector x. So when I look at the first couple lines from x, you can see that it looks like um, HTML, which is kind of what you would expect. And so the URL function is useful for creating a connection to a, kind of a non-file object, and then using read.lines is useful to read the text from that connection. So this is another way to read data uh, beyond using functions like read.table or read.csv. Benefits of using uh, this kind of um, uh, approach is to, if you, for example, go and have a connection to a GZ file, so it's a zipped file. Now, you cannot read a zipped file on its own by read.table or read.csv or any of the read functions. Um, and now assuming, let's say you have a 10 GB zipped file. Right? That means that if you extract it, it will probably be a lot bigger. It will probably be like 20 GB file, and it will be very hard. You don't have enough memory. So one hack would be that you just zip that file and create a smaller file of that. Excuse me. And then just read that file line by line by this kind of connection uh, way. 
So it just simplifies that process. So the equivalent would be supposing you are um, just off the top of my head, you have a genome file, genome FASTA file, uh, and that genome FASTA file is say 20 gigs, and my memory is 16 GB on this laptop. So now I can zip my genome file and make it into a 10 GB zip file, load that file via a connection, and then keep reading uh, one of uh, say 100 lines at a time, and then search for a particular sequence that I'm looking for. Uh, in in that uh, uh, that ten lines that I find until I find that particular sequence that I'm looking for. So that requires looking. So that would be if you were doing something on like a local laptop. But you probably won't need to do that if you were doing it on the cluster. Probably right? not. Okay. Probably not. Does so, the connection generate a temporary file? So the connection is actually what it. That's really just a pipe that you create. For example, when you open an SSH connection to the server you are essentially creating a pipe uh, between your computer and the data uh, and the server. So it's a virtual channel that you create and so that's a connection. But then the unzipped file, is it storing the uh, remote? So, so basically what it, what, what's probably happening is that uh, once you open this connection, it sends in binary, uh, binary data on the connection mm -hmm. and then once it reaches R it just unzips that particular line of uh, you know so that particular data set and then displays the 10 lines so it doesn't unzip the whole thing it'll get a chunk or, or a chunk of data okay I see. So, all right. any other questions with this so if not then we can just basically go ahead and open uh, our studio and uh, uh, it's it's here now if, if I just do this words.gz over here uh, and then see that it shows up but it will only work if you have words.gz files stored in your directory so uh, please make sure that you have this words.gz file it's 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 part of the the data sets here uh, right over here uh, in this book data sets, this contains the uh, the actual words.gz. So this is just a way to demonstrate this, that you can actually read this and read the lines. All right? Um, that's, that's what we're trying to do here. Okay. Now, apart from this, um, there are other formats, like RDA is a binary format. And the advantage of storing something in a binary format is uh, obviously space, um, and you get your entire you know workspace saved as a binary format. So whatever variables, everything gets stored into. You can just do that, um, and you can load that entire set of variables back into your workspace, and it it's as if they never left uh, with all the properties. Um, and then I think the this is an interesting concept serialize um, so you have to specify the output here it's saying null so let's uh, if you see the serialization interface here let's quickly go over this is a good example of how to read the help file I don't know if you has anybody used this help uh, have any of you used this help the R help, do you use it yeah. some time to time? So it's so this is a low level interface to serializing for serializing to connection. Uh, basically you give it an object and then a connection, an open connection to serialize or null for unserialize for a vector. And um, it it's able to you know move that object to that via that connection to whatever the app, whatever uh, the connection leads to uh, in a, you know, right? So what it's saying is the function serialize, uh, serializes the object to a specific connection. And if the connection is null, then the object is serialized to a raw vector. So notice it changes the actual format of the, uh, of the vector. It converts this into so into a binary format again, or some sort of serializable, easily transferable format. 
All right. So there are three numbers here, and then here there are 61, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 70, 70 of these characters, which essentially represent this list 1, 2, and 3. All right. Um, Okay, the rest of them are, you know, uh, other stuff, but... Yeah, <laughs> I, I guess he took the example from here <laughs> in the code. All right, so moving on, we can just go on, moving on. Um, this is done. So this is interesting, The opening the connection from a web page. Uh, I don't I haven't personally used it I mean notice how it's taking a little while because it's going over the internet to get to that connection to create that connection um, and then once it's created you can read these lines now you could technically use any other site name here as well and just open a connection to them uh, as long as you know it's it's, it's the site exists so here it's taking that site. So now a connection has been opened to this particular site. And if you read 10 lines from it and display it here, so it can just, it shows you uh, this is real time. Now let, let's, you know, let's just for fun, we can change this. Uh, uh, closing. Oh, so if we were to you change this, you any particular site you like? Oh, that was fast. So Google <laughs> has a very different format. Per line, so one line in Google. Like, look at this. This is essentially live from uh, today's Google's website. So, whoever this person is, Hertha Marx. Notice her name appears here. You see, and Google changes this every day. So if you wanted to parse this, you could actually just parse every day. You can just read an R, uh, write a short script that will open a connection, read the line, and take the first line and extract who's, uh, what is this uh, birthday. Like it would probably come after um, meta content equal to, you can search for this and you know that today Google is talking about this, uh, this person, you know? without you know without having to look at the image you can just write the matrix. you're reading you read the <laughs> matrix code and you know all right exactly okay so I think that's pretty much it in terms of uh, of this and then I had added a couple of lines just to show you that you can read this for tables but uh, read tables of other files but you can do that anyways um, so this, I'm just trying to show you that you can, you know, like this is a standard genes RNA-seq file that we get. And so these are samples and these are, you know, genes, gene names. Uh, you can go uh, and try to find out what each is. And there's 24,000 rows and 10 columns uh, in this matrix. Uh, but this actually, the file um, it exists over there. Um, if I wanted, I could go see this file. It'll be in under bioinformatics, and uh, here this one genes.counts.txt. This is the file that I'm reading in. Um, let's take a five-minute break, and since we are here, let's try and do another couple of or uh, uh, the other few remaining part of this uh, chapter here. We can try to use the. Uh, Maybe subsetting R objects and vectorized operations or try to finish one of these. Okay. We'll try this. This this part looks easier, subsetting R objects. Because we have done part of this, right? We have done the matrix and how to subset it and 
uh, how to subset lists and all those. But we'll just watch the video and have a discussion on this. Okay? Is subsetting like slicing? Like Basically, taking portions of it out. How to subset, uh, you know, access elements of a matrix or a list. So can I ask you just that? Yeah. A general question. Please. So in, in R, I noticed they don't like using equals. They always use this. Greater than. Dash is less than arrow thing. Yeah. Which. Yeah. It requires an extra click. It does why, require. <laughs> why, why? I mean, is there a reason? Um, you know, initially it is very annoying. Would I, would I be ridiculed for using an equal sign there? <laughs> you would not be ridiculed. I don't think. But I think it's one of those, uh, you know, uh, uh, as you become more and more into R, you kind of want to be a part of the herd. I know, because it goes against the economy of keystrokes. Absolutely. Right? It's not efficient. It's uh, really not something that, but, you know, I mean, you get used to it really fast. Yeah, I'm sure you do. <laughs> I wasn't sure if there was like, some specific reason. I, I, you know, if... Because so often you should be most in the country. Yeah. Yeah. Press option yeah. and dash yeah. all together, uh, and it's just generally. Huh? Uh, press so and option and a dash. Yeah, yeah, together. Uh oh. Option minus or option? Minus. I'm sorry, not minus. So option minus just decreases the screen size. For me, if I do an option minus, it just decreases the screen size. No, no, you're pushing the command. The option. Oh, the option. Out. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, oh, there you go. Yeah, it's bigger. Yeah. It's bigger. No, the know? option minus. She's saying that if you press option and minus, and then it's a good shortcut to create the... the yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. No problem. Oh. Yeah, but still, two, uh, two yeah, well, yeah, okay. Option. I'm going to read it down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like R. It's really confusing. <laughs> All right, we'll take a two-minute break, and then we come back, and uh, we can try and start subsetting. Open your R Studio. Can you open the file subsetting.r? It should be in the code, the book code files that you downloaded. This is the file subsetting.r. And once you open that, we will start working on it here. Um, so let's start with this vector x. And so we can do x1 and we extract the first element, and that is a. Um, now, an interesting tidbit here is you could try to do the class of x1. And it tells you that the class is a character. So it's, and if you do a class on x, it's also a character vector. So they say maintain the same class. Uh, x2, same way, it's b. Uh, if you were to try to do x2 comma anything, it'll give you an error because the dimensions are incorrect. Do vectors have to be the same class? Everything, all elements? Yes, okay. they do. So 1 colon 4, if you just do 1 colon 4, it tells you 1, 2, 3, 4. So this is where your answer lies. You see, uh, essentially when you're saying what within that it the the expression gets evaluated first within this so true false true false false all of those are evaluated and only then the answer is given so a simple thing would be if you just created a vector within this of true false true so now what happens is that you get true, and here you get B is removed, and you get true, true, uh, and then the remaining. Okay? Does that make sense? All right, you can play around with this. <laughs> All right, so basically that's, if you put a false, it won't get evaluated. And then you only get what the, the ones that are uh, true. Okay, all right, so moving on. Uh, so 
the first you can select the positions that you want and then this was the logical thing where you're trying to see whether u is uh, assigned which elements are greater than a so the lexical order that we were talking about and if you do x of u so the same kind of principle is going here you know the, if you, if it's false it doesn't get printed uh, and only the true values get printed at, or in the next step okay so uh, same thing you could do the same exact step like this instead of doing the whole two, two step thing so we create a matrix with two rows and three columns and now we're subsetting the matrix taking the first first row or first column first row and second column so that gives us this element 3 uh, or 2 1 and here we want to extract the full row so we just leave this part blank and then we get just the first row. Similarly, we re leave the first thing here blank and we get the first column, uh, second column. Uh, then here again, it's the same thing, matrix, uh, one, two. But now we want to create a matrix instead of the element. So we create a one by one matrix here. So notice this it tells you that this is one column, one row matrix as opposed to just being one element here. Okay, so same thing here. We create um, an, another matrix with just one row and three columns um, by using the drop. And here we're creating a list. Now we're trying to subset a list. We're just doing, this is the, uh, you know, double brackets. So what do we get here? Is this a list or no? No, good. So this is not a list. This is just the um, the vector or the elements one, two, three, four. Whereas if we just do x comma one, then this is a list. It even has the name foo. Uh, so similarly, now we do the bar as the element, just the element, as opposed to x dollar bar, uh, which is also the element, which is the same as the double bracket. Uh, next, the uh, list that we create here, we change the name to this foo, and now if we uh, compute the index for, uh, we, for we're just using the name, it gets the values one to four. But if you do x dollar name, it's null. If you do x dollar foo, we get the same thing one two three four, which is the same as this. Uh, let's create two lists this time. Uh, uh, a list within a list, and. This was the part where we do the recursion. So first element, third, uh, first list, and then within that, the third element of that list, um, as opposed to going the other way, which is the same as this, where you take you know explicitly the first list, and then within that list, what is the uh, third? Can you, can you hit X? I just want to see what X is. <laughs> sure. Displays it. Sure. So, so it displays it as the first A, Within A, the first, there's another element 10 of that list, mm -hmm. and then the second element of that list is 12, and then 2, 3, 1 is 14. And then like B is another, uh, just a simple vector. All right? Okay. Uh, so create this list with three elements. Uh, 1, 3 is this. Okay, notice there's only one bracket here. Uh, what would happen if we put the two brackets? <laughs> what is, where did it get the three? Huh? Right. But it doesn't really change that. So if you just do one comma three with one bracket, it gives you uh, these both these elements. It subsets it like this. Whereas if you do double bracket, then it just gets the third element of that. Okay. So one more. This we just talked about. And <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, we have 
we have um, the x a is null because there's an exact match as false and we just went over this so um, this should be clear now this is the part where we test for NAs so now we can actually well here you go we print bad to get what the values are within bad false false true false true false another good way to do is to print not bad and see that it actually does reverse the bits so we instead of getting where false was where true and therefore now when we say not bad this another thing we can do is go table on bad to find out how many values are false and how many are true uh, if you do the reverse table it changes okay uh, all right so same thing here x y complete cases very useful function so uh, t tell me something what if we had one more element here then what so it gives you an error saying that not all arguments have the same length so complete cases works only if you have the same length now let's say we have this In this case you have the same length so what does good look like now so true true false true the last one now becomes false. Does that make sense? Even though in X, this is in fact not an NA, but because in Y, this is an NA, it changes to false. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. All right. So, so by default, you have air quality as a data frame here. If you just do dim air quality, it comes in R. Okay. So it has 153 rows and six columns. So here you're only taking the first few. So good is a complete cases on air quality by default. Now, one thing you can do is go table good it'll tell you how many trues and how many false are there in the entire table another thing you can do is do a summary on good and well or you could do a summary on air quality and it actually tells you uh, for each column what is the minimum what is the maximum and the number of na's in that column So summary is an important uh, function that I use sometimes to find out what exactly my data frame contains. Uh, sometimes I could also do a box plot on this summary or box plot of this, uh, uh, of this air quality after I remove the NAs. So once I do a complete dot cases and I'm just here it's doing the head on air quality good but you could also just do a box plot on air quality uh, with just the good ones and uh, okay so in this case it's complaining that I don't have enough margin width It should work in yours. If it doesn't, then it's probably because uh, oh wait, this is history. Oh, sorry, the wrong plot. It's the wrong plot. Uh, I should be giving margins here. <laughs> there you go. Uh, so what this error was is just saying that I don't have enough margins in my plot. So now I do, and so it plotted it. Okay. Yeah, just a simple example. Okay. Uh, How do I replace an A mm -hmm. in a table with value zero? Right. So if you want to replace replace those by zeros, 
you can do that. You can actually just say, so let's say, uh, instead of doing this, complete dot cases, you can do air quality one. Let's just first save air quality as another variable because that's what I want to change. Then we can say air quality one uh, is dot na uh, if it is na air quality one then I assign all those values to zero All right, sure. Equal. So now, technically, if all goes well, then that has happened. So now, if you do a summary of air quality one, it'll show you that there are no NAs. And you can compare that summary to air quality and it should look give you that exact difference to clarify what just happened so notice the maximum here is 168 and it is the same maximum here uh, is the same as huh the quartiles have changed so here the quartiles have gone up um, compared to here because of the NAs so you've put the zeros there, so the quartile of the distribution has changed. Um, and then notice also the minimum here is one, whereas the minimum here is zero now. So when there's NAs, it doesn't use those in calculations at all, right? But when you put zero, then you start weighting it to lower numbers. Yes. So the same thing in single cell data when you have, you know, low counts versus zero counts versus, you know, yeah. whether it's a real zero if you count it as a real zero in your distribution, then it makes a difference in terms of your uh, distribution, uh, uh, whether it's now the minimum is zero as opposed to one or as opposed to the quartile is different and the modeling will be similarly different. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so I think that should be